Our next guest is a former Navy F-18 pilot who claims to have witnessed multiple unidentified aerial phenomena, a.k.a. UFOs. I don't know when we change the terminology on that. Like I grew up, it was always UFOs. Now it's unidentified aerial phenomena. But he's not a random person. He is a he's works on R and D programs for DARPA for the Office of Naval Research. This is a legit person, and you know how I know you're legit, Ryan. You're a legit no. pilot because you got a cool nickname, Fobs. Fobs. <laughs> How'd you get that nickname? Uh, I got it the same way as everyone else uh, at a call sign review board. How does? Wait, how does I know I'm not answering your question. I'm doing it. Uh, I'm answering clearly, but. Uh, it actually stands for uh, "full of Boston spirit." Oh, okay. oh, you're from Boston, <laughs> Fobs. That's right. Hey, me too. <laughs> Thanks, How you doing? Not Boston proper, but Massachusetts. Yeah, well, same. Same thing for yeah. Charlotte over yeah. there. Yeah. All right. There's yeah. a review board for this. Oh, it's, yeah, it's very official. We don't want to slip anything in that uh, might offend someone's grandmother on the side of the jet. What did you What did you do to earn the nickname "full of Boston spirit"? Um. Well. Uh, I don't want to get too too far down the rabbit hole, but let's let's just say that there were other options on the table, but they did not meet the qualification of being something you could tell to your grandmother. <laughs> I just I have him showing up just talking Red Sox all the damn time. Won't shut up about how Larry Bird is the best player ever. Uh, Tom Brady, Tom Brady, Tom Brady, a little bit more Tom Brady. Am I in the ballpark? I was watching. Um, I was watching when Bledsoe blew out his knee, and uh, and uh, oh. Brady went in, and I had the best high school years of my life watching football and watching them go all the way. It was just an incredible time, and never mind the Red Sox. So yeah, I've been. I grew up enjoying uh, the local sports. So so Ryan, you're you're in the news right now because of your congressional testimony about you know what you saw uh, when you were flying, and if we could for the video department, could we throw up? that clip of Ryan talking to Congress. These objects were staying completely stationary in category four hurricane winds. These same objects would then accelerate to supersonic speeds, 1.1, 1.2 Mach, uh, and they would do so in very erratic and, and quick behaviors that we don't, I don't have an explanation for. So Ryan, I guess my first question to you would be, when you saw this, what was the reaction of all the people you were talking to either on radio or when you landed later? Yeah, when we first saw these objects, we didn't jump to any uh, conclusion that it was something bizarre. Uh, when we first actually detected them, we detected them on our radar systems, uh, and we thought they were radar error. And then we got close enough to see them with our cameras. And that's when we were certain there was something physical there, and we really had to respect it. But again, we didn't go to, to you know UFOs, UAP, or, or anything too wacky. We just thought perhaps it was some type of drone program, something classified that we weren't aware of. But over time up to then, we started to kind of gather more information as a squadron and started to see these more exotic behaviors. And when we left, you know, we essentially just stopped talking about it. Um, we didn't really have an answer and we weren't going to sit around talking about UFOs all day. So um, we really didn't have an answer for what they were. And frankly, we still don't know what they are. We, we call them UAPs. We sometimes call them UFOs, but we don't know what those objects are still. Ryan, why were you guys able to now find these unidentified flying phenomenons or whatever? Like, was it an upgrade in machinery? Did you guys uh, get something new that was, all right, this is going to show us different things? Like, what was, the, what was that? Yeah, that's exactly right. So we have our primary tools, our, our radar system, and we were using the APG-73 radar, which is a pretty decent radar, but it's a, an older technology. Our particular jets in my squadron, not my squadron, but in the squadron I was in, VFA-11, uh, we happened to have a particular lot off the line of F-18s uh, that were plumbed essentially to upgrade the radar. Uh, not all of them were. And so when we came back from our deployment, they took out the older radars and put in the newer APG-79, which required different cooling and other mechanisms. Uh, and when we did that, it took about six months or so to upgrade every jet we had. But we'd fly with on one day with um, the newer radar, and we would see all these objects, and we didn't know what they were. And then we might fly with a different jet later that day that did not have the radar, uh, and we wouldn't see them anymore. And it was it was that simple. You picked it up on radar. Could you see it with your naked eye? So no, I personally was not able to see it with my naked eye. 
what we would do essentially to try to ID these is we would come to what we call a merge, which is a point where our radar uh, radar points merge into one contact. That's where the term comes from. Uh, and so we do this often. We come to merges uh, when we train to dogfight. Uh, typically, we'll come with almost 1,200 uh, miles of closure zipping by each other. And when we do that, we get a very good look at each other. We'll look at how we're condensing the air around the wings to see if they're going in a certain direction, to see if their energy state is low, see if their, their flaps or their ailerons are, are moving around, see if their weapon loadout, um, see what their weapon loadout is. Mm -hmm. All sorts of things we're looking at in this very small uh, window of time. And we do this all the time, uh, every day for periods of time sometime. Uh, and so when that's the same tactics we would use to uh, go visually ID one of these, uh, except we would slow down to try to close that or to make that closure rate smaller and smaller so we could see more information. And so we would go about 200 miles an hour, at least this was my experience. We'd have it on our radar. We'd see it on our camera system. Um, our weapons would lock on to the objects. Uh, our IR missiles would lock on and give us what we call a screaming tone uh, in our headset. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then all that information is being pumped into our visor. And on my visor is a little display, which puts a little box around the object, the space in the sky where I should look to be able to see the object that all of my sensors are telling me is there. And as we would go within 500 feet of these objects, um, looking up at it, trying to see it, um, couldn't see it. Uh, I turn back around and we'd see the object still there, perhaps at a different altitude, perhaps offset somewhat, but they would still be there. And, and that was that. Um, it wasn't until we almost hit one of the objects when we first actually visually ID'd it. Uh, and that was a strange incident because the air crew never had the object on their radar, uh, which was a slightly different scenario than my experience up to that point. Uh, and the object was also completely stationary at the essentially the doorway to our working areas at a very specific point in altitude. And it went right between two jets, two F-18s, and they they canceled the flight. The, the lead of the pilot saw it and he said, hey, I saw I saw one of those damn things. Uh, it looked like a dark gray or a black cube inside of a clear sphere. But how many times have you guys seen them? So we we were loosely you know having conversations about this in the um in the squadron as far as people that like visually could idea as that particular shape at the time i knew of maybe uh 15 or 20 people um we weren't necessarily going out and surveying all the various squadrons but that was our squadron's experience uh since then i've learned that this was a problem that all squadrons that upgraded their radars as one would expect were seeing these objects um and not only did it happen within period of 2014 to 2015, um, I left in 2015, I thought the problem ended, but since then, I've come to learn that not only did it continue to happen, but it is still happening today. I had former students reach out to me that I instructed as a, as a pilot in the Navy, essentially the next generation of pilots that went out there and said, hey, I saw, I saw a hmm. dark, dark gray and black cube inside of a sphere as well. Call me back, now and that was in 2020, I believe. After you see an object like this, uh, do any of your higher ups come up with any other explanations to you? Are they offering anything that uh, can explain what you just saw? Uh, my experience at the time was no, there was no explanation. Um, they just, it was just no one knew. Uh, there was not an answer provided. Uh, it was essentially, you know, get back to work. Ryan, when you talk about category four winds and it's standing still going at one point, one to one point, to mock can you put that into like layman's terms for people that don't really understand the technology that you were watching and witnessing that we really don't have access to absolutely so think about sticking your hand out the window uh not that easy to keep it very still at 50 miles an hour when you're in the car um now take that 50 miles an hour and, and add that up to about 300 and, or excuse me 130 miles an hour uh, put your hand out the window and try to leave it absolutely perfectly stationary in those winds. That's what these objects were doing, uh, and they're doing it at high altitudes. Um, we we have a term when we're flying around the area uh, if it's very windy, and we'll say we're 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 fighting fighting to stay in the area, uh, and that's the literal terminology that this particular pilot report used to describe their effort to remain in the area. 
if you take a big turn in a jet and there's a very strong wind this way, if you don't time your turn well, it could push you four, five, six miles during that turn and actually push you out of the area. And so this F-18 is, and I quote, fighting to stay in the area to try to get close to observe this object that is somehow stationary uh, at high altitudes and high winds. And he doesn't know, he can't identify what it is. Is there any chance that this is, I mean, when you were watching this happen, were you thinking like, oh, these are aliens, like these are alien life forms? Because I feel like people quickly jump there. But have you, are there other explanations? Could it be some like crazy technology from other humans somewhere? Like, I, I feel like the the leap from here are these objects to we're being invaded by aliens gets made very quickly. And I wondered what your thoughts on that were. Yeah, I agree. It does get made uh, quickly, and I would say too quickly. Uh, it's it's uncomfortable to live in that area of uncertainty, especially on this topic. Uh, but frankly, that's where we need to live right now. We we can't make that jump because if we if we do, we're either going to ignore the topic, people are going to shut down to it, um, or you're going to start investigating in ways that don't make sense for the problem itself. And so you really have to approach it from a first principled approach and not add all that cultural baggage onto it. And it's a challenge. It's hard. And people do it, you know, they do it within a split second having a conversation. It's a defensive reaction, it seems. Ryan, uh, under a minute here, you had your testimony in Congress. What did you not get to say to Congress that you would have liked to say? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, honestly, I felt pretty satisfied being able to share what I shared. Um I think there are a lot of individual stories I could have sat down and shared with them and they would have loved to hear one after another, uh, but there just wasn't time for it. But that's part of the effort we're doing at safeaerospace.org and people can sign up there and show their support to Congress. His name is Ryan Graves. He's the executive director of the nonprofit Americans for Safe Aerospace. Check out the Merge podcast with Ryan Graves. Ryan, thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks for having me. Brad Williams has been pulled from the game. You can Damn. see him at the Miami Improv. His seat has been occupied by Charlotte Wilder, who does Oddball with Amin El Hassan. It is a daily show. It is quirky. Except it, for Mondays. It is unusual. <laughs> uh, daily except for Monday. Uh, thank you, Amin, for that <laughs> clarification. Uh, we are going to talk aliens here uh, in a little bit with someone who is an expert on having told us publicly in a way that seems super credible that there has been, the United States government has indeed found life that is not human. What are you looking at me like we're, that for? We're talking to Tony? Finally. <laughs> I said credible. I said someone who has credibility on these matters. Why are you sipping vigorously from a glass He's of Greg Cody a, now. A glass <laughs> of water while while broadcasting. What are you doing? Oh, wait, are you not supposed to drink water while broadcasting? That's well, how a, I... a glass is an I don't often see in broadcast settings a glass that I would find in my kitchen. I, usually it's a mug. Well, we have a kitchen. I, 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 mean, I know, but I have usually. Am I wrong about this? I have not watched a lot of television where I see someone drinking on a sports broadcast from a glass. You've been, it, you've been hanging out with David Sampson too long. Now you want mugs with our show logo on it. <laughs> I don't want mugs. I just am a surprised. Bottle. I'm surprised by a glass that you would find at a dinner table with the fine cutlery and the good china. I'm surprised surprised that there's a glass out here as opposed to a paper cup or th really honestly you could be drinking out of a football helmet and i would find it less unusual than <laughs> than the glass that you're drinking out of you're lucky i didn't bring the congressional senate hearing mug uh excuse me glass with the with the little pitcher too I should have the pitcher and the glass go shh Am I lucky? Yes. Am I indeed lucky that that's <laughs> not what you did? Uh, when Charlotte got here, though, it made me think, and I do not know why it is that it made me think this, but my wife, apropos of nothing, the other day said to me this sentence, 
out of nowhere. We were not talking about anything. 12% of people dream in black and white. Hmm. And I thought that sounded high. And for some reason, I thought uh, Charlotte would be unusual enough that perhaps, <laughs> that, 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 that perhaps, she, perhaps she was dreaming in black and white. Is there anyone here who dreams in black and white? Dan, that is, I'm not sure if that's a compliment, but I'm going to take it as one. I like thinking that I'm here, like, dreaming in, in Christopher Nolan Oppenheimer. You know, like, everything's very Oppenheim. serious. But in reality... <laughs> That's a, that's a joke. No, he made it yesterday. It's from yesterday. That you both share, that Amin and Stugatz both share the agent Lou Oppenheim, who no one would make a movie about and is an agent straight out of the 1950s. Sweet Lou. Does anyone in our audience listening to this dream in black and white? They're... I thought that that was an unusually high number, that one, that more than one out of ten people are dreaming in black and white seemed impossible to can me. I, can I ask Valerie Levitard, who's doing the math on that? How are we doing the math on that? Here's the thing, though. Now that you say it, I'm like, yeah. have I ever seen color in my, like, have I ever dreamt in blue or have I ever seen purple in my dream? I think I might actually dream in black and white, Dan. Because you've never given it any thought before this moment? And now, oh, oh my God, or sepia. What's the, per what's the percentage on sepia? Is it sepia or sepia? Well, sepia. Sep sepia okay, yeah. sepia. No, but I, I, look, as someone who routinely dreams and writes down and, you know, documents his dreams. You have a dream log? Oh I do. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, oh wait, he oh, does. He wow. can't do this again. Right. What's the latest? He can't do right. this again, please. The, uh, oh, the, what's the latest? The latest one. What was the latest one I had? The latest one I had was about going to Kmart, which is a blast in the past, and trying to buy. Kenya Martin. <laughs> <laughs> trying to purchase a hunting rifle, which is such a weird thing for me to dream about because I don't, you know. Other than Red Dead Redemption, I don't really go hunting or anything like that. But the point is, my dreams are all in color, baby. Full technicolor, <laughs> like the Wizard of Oz after she lands right on the Wicked Witch of the East. Everything, blues and greens and golds, easily, man. What is the present state of Kmart? There are a few somewhere. I know there are one, I think... We talked at one point of doing a Moss Miami at an abandoned Kmart here in Miami, or the last of the Kmarts. A big, big story out of New York City. This will amuse, I think, Amin and Charlotte. The famous Kmart that was underground in the Astor Place subway station yes. in the East Village is turning into the city's first Wegmans later this fall. Whoa. Wegmans wow. from the Midwest? Wegman's no. like the place where they cut up all the vegetable. You can't buy a whole vegetable. You have to buy them like prepackaged. I don't think Wegman's is Wegman's Midwest. I thought Wegman's was like Northeast. Yeah, it's like North Philadelphia. Yeah, oh. I thought like up. I think of like New York when I think of Wegman's. To answer your question, Dan, there's one on One Thirty Seventh and Kendall, a Kmart, and there's one on Eighth Street. Those are the only two in Miami that I but can remember. But they're active, so those are Miami Kmart's that are still active. If I had to get a number of Kmart stores that still exist in the United States, uh, because Walmart has engulfed. I mean, I know Amazon has engulfed all of this yeah. stuff, but in terms of being associated with, I'm going to go get something cheaply. I'm going to go to a place, and it's not going to cost very much. Kmart is the uh, the store from my youth that has now been replaced by Walmart. Or the dollar store. Okay, that's aggressive. The, the <laughs> state with the most number of Kmart locations, according to Google.com, is the U.S. Virgin Islands, which has wow. four Kmarts, which is about 20% of all Kmart stores in the U.S. Oh, wow. Huh. Which feels high. high? Yeah. Like there should be, like 20% shouldn't be four stores well, that means there's 16 stores left 16 kmarts and two of them are in miami one of them for sure one might be a front for something else but now it's just <laughs> that's the case tbd i don't everything know I'll, I'll go and investigate did you just call the uh the the u.s virgin islands a state mm. yes because google did and then i realized it's a territory maybe don't trust the internet <laughs> duh so uh, everything you've said now is called you've the There are also 20 Kmart stores, according to this thing, that called the U.S. Virgin Islands a state, so I trust nothing that I've just contributed to this fine program. You, uh, you cannot trust the Internet. The Internet told us earlier in the show that Ron Say is 5'10", <laughs> uh, and that is not something. What, what Whittingham has something on this subject. Well, according to this website that has 20 Kmart locations left, eight of them are on territories. 
The U.S. Virgin Islands is four, Puerto Rico is three, and Guam has one. I guess they didn't get the news. Twelve in the contiguous United States. There needs to be like a Juneteenth. (laughs) <laughs> for Kmart, though. <laughs> Liberation. Hey, by the way, Kmart's done. Like, what? Stugatz mentioned earlier in the show, he mentioned when we were talking about the broadcast team of Jeff Van Gundy and Mark Jackson and Mike Breen being uh, broken apart, he mentioned the phrase outrage as it came to the way people react to their familiar things being broken apart. And it made me think of something that skated under the radar here in the news recently uh, that made me think of how meaningless most sports outrage is. It's being reported that Fox is about to make a giant offer for the exclusivity of Alex Rodriguez on its broadcasts. And when I think of Alex Rodriguez, I think of how meaningless sports outrage actually is if you can be someone who we yelled at about lying and cheating and now there would be a bidding war for your exclusivity because you're so valuable that you work at ESPN and Fox. <laughs> and this is the part, this is the part to me that makes your outrage all the more meaningless. He's only getting these parts because he's famous. He's not particularly good at broadcasting. He's good at smiling on television. He's good at looking good and being famous on television. But as a broadcaster, he says next to nothing that is illuminating, interesting, funny, or even charismatic. Just like Urban Meyer. Let me just say right now, do you want to know the power of Alex Rodriguez, popularity and fame, actually, rather than popularity? I, last Saturday, I went to a D-backs game with my kids. It was Star Wars night, so that's why I went. And they were playing the Mariners. I Mar- was wondering. Thank you for explaining. <laughs> <laughs> they were playing the Mariners, and I saw a bunch of people wearing Mariners Rodriguez jerseys. I was like, wow, those A-Rod jerseys are really flying off the shelves. And then I discovered, like, the right fielder's name is Rodriguez. I was like, oh, never mind. That's how famous Rod- Alex Rodriguez is. He's so famous that my ass thought that all these people were wearing A-Rod jerseys. Does the outrage mean anything? It doesn't. But, no. But it sounds nice in the moment. But the reality is none of this matters. None of it matters. Then why isn't Barry Bonds on television? Because he's not good at it. Well, maybe he doesn't want to be on television. Oh, wait a minute. I just said that A-Rod's not good at it, and I assure no. you that Barry Bonds would say more interesting things than A-Rod no, no, would no, no. if he were – if he were because Barry Bonds would care less what people think. Barry Bonds would be less careful. I, uh, I spent a lot of time with Barry Bonds at the Westminster Dog Show a few years ago. <laughs> Hold on a second. That's why, we brought, mm-hmm. that's, that's why we signed her, guys. Just wait yep. for it. Yep. Hold on. Hold, Hold on. on. All right, wait, I'm, Thank you. Yeah, I think that I think it's more so, looking me, Louie, for being able to go to the dog yeah, show. But cool. and it, Barry Bonds and his sister co-own a dog that was showing at the dog show, and so I'm ch- and his people like really didn't want me to talk to him, but I was talking to him, and and he just kept talking, and he was telling me about his home gym, that he was that he he was like I spent four thousand dollars on this, and I was like for Barry oh, Bonds yeah. seems sort of low, I'm into yeah. it, <laughs> and he was like it's all magnetic. And he was like, and, and you can work out with other people through my, like, system of, of video. He was like, we could work out together. And I was like, I don't think I'm that ever. I, I can't have a $4,000 gym, Barry. Um, and he kept talking to me to the point that his people were like, you have to go. And he would not stop talking about his gym. So I think he might be amazing on television. Let me just say right now, then you poor, innocent, foolish man. You're like, I just said A-Rod isn't good at it. There's two types of not good at it. There's a not good at it where it's like I'm not saying anything, but I'm just sitting there and looking like A-Rod. And then there's a not good at it where <laughs> I don't follow the, the basic principles and rules of this thing. And Barry Bonds strikes me as the kind of guy who would not follow the basic principles and rules of doing a TV show. Namely, I talk and then you talk. He'd be like, no, nah, to hell with this. I'm going to talk anyway. And, like, and that they can't abide by that. <laughs> Bonds has a bigger ego, you're saying. Yeah. 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 A-Rod and Barry Bonds, we have proof. Neither of them are good at following rules. (laughs) So, Stu got some Mega Millions. Crossed the billion-dollar threshold. Yeah. You feeling lucky? 
Well, I spent uh, I spent about fifty dollars on tickets last night. Mm-hmm. Uh, did not win. I keep doing it because once it gets up to around a billion dollars, it's hard to not go buy some tickets. You know, I won't pay for more than just one slip. Was that ten bucks for the the full sheet? Yeah, yeah, dude. If I, if do I don't you want- auto pick. Uh, I do auto pick on four of them. Isn't it like there are five different ones on the sheet? Yeah. So I do auto pick on four of them, and on the fifth one, I pick my own numbers, and that's it. That's I don't need to do. People are paying a hundred dollars worth for tickets. Like I don't understand that at all. I have a question. Yeah. Forgive my ignorance. Yes. Why does it seem like the Mega Millions and the Powerball are hitting a billion like every couple months now? I feel like that never used to happen. Is it that? So many more people are playing it? I have no idea, but I'll tell you what I do. When one of them hits a billion dollars, everyone forgets about the other one. So I go to the other one because I think your odds are better, and what's wrong with winning $90 million? No, that's a great point. Don't your odds odds stay exactly the same no matter the prize? I'm sure it does. But it just seems like... Feels like a smarter play. It seems like we used to not hit a billion as often as we are now. So... All of these uh, lot of Mega Millions and Powerball, they're multi-state lotteries, right? And up until, I want to say, 25 years ago, there were only state lotteries. So then they, they came up, they were kind of competing, and slowly but surely, more and more states became members. And I think now you can buy a Mega Millions or a Powerball ticket in every single state. And because of that, there are more people with like, access to buy them, so the jackpots are bigger. The other thing they've realized is the big jackpots bring out bigger crowds trying to buy it. you got people like Sugats who don't usually pay the lottery but will pay fifty dollars like now me. or people like you or I people powerball like I, do packed. It too. I do it too mm-hmm. i also just learned as you were speaking that mega millions and powerball are two separate things yeah nice. what there you go they have different names i thought it was interchangeable <laughs> i thought it was interchangeable so Wait, so if you win the Mega, you think you can cash it in for Powerball? I thought I thought there was only one amount of money at any given time, and you could either call it Powerball or Mega Millions, she, depending on how you were feeling. She too. thought its last name was Millions, first name is Mega, but then its nickname was Powerball. Yes, I did. When I you did. see the billboards and there's two different numbers on them, yeah. what do you think that the numbers mean? Um, I... Don't know that I Boxed realized in. that there I were got two. your ass. <laughs> God damn it. You were so pleased too. By the way, <laughs> that smile on her face. Oh, no, oh it's man. an either or oh, thing. Okay, number. You're like, ooh, maybe it's forty million. Maybe it's five hundred million. I thought you, you added them know. together, Jess. I thought you added them together. Or it's like a range. Uh, <laughs> one is the low end, the other is the between high end. ninety and a billion. <laughs> I've never played the lottery ever. Never, not one time. You should play it now, because then if you win, everyone's gonna be real pissed. You have a one in two hundred and ninety-two point two million cha- dollar or million chance. Yeah. I don't know why I said well dollar. Said. <laughs> I was thinking million dollars because of Mega Millions. So I, I want to show yeah. you guys something. I want to throw something on the screen. Jason, who works in video with us, bought a Powerball ticket that was off. By one digit. N- this is winning- this is for the billion prize, yes, correct? From the yes. winning numbers. Yeah. So the first number he got right, eight. Second number, 24. Ooh, he went 25. The third winning number was 30. He went 31. The fourth winning number was 45. He went 46. No way. The fifth winning number was 61. He went 60. And then the Powerball number... He was off by two. Right. It's 12. He got 14. That's it seems crazy. like the ticket yeah, before his was the winner. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Did he choose those numbers or was that a. I think it's. Quick pick, quick pick, quick pick on the. Uh... On that's heartbreaking, line. man. Oh, that, that, no, that, like, horrifying. That, I'd rather just like be completely off than Wh- do that. Which is, which is like the, the two times that I played the lottery for these billion dollar prizes. I, you don't even get near a number, and you'd, you'd rather be there than oh, yeah. a number off for all of them. No, that, that right there, that's God laughing at you, Jason. That's it. <laughs> you, you, oh, you thought you were gonna quit? You thought this this would be it? You, you done? <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like Jason should win something though. He was so close. I mean, he couple wins of the bucks. Mega Millions. <laughs> <laughs> that was. Pretty yeah. Powerball, now exactly. he wins like a million. See, oh, now wow. it makes sense. On the low sense. end of the That's range. Unbelievable. Now it makes sense. He wins a smaller amount. Wait, do you guys consistently play these games, or does it need to reach a certain amount for Billion. you to... It has to be in the news for me to buy a ticket. <laughs> really? Really? Great show. My really? friend play, My friend Priya plays religiously, like, all the time on her phone. She goes, gets in, gets tickets. You can... There's, like, an Do app on in, the phone? in New York, apparently. Yeah, there's a yeah, power there, there should yes. be. Because it's ridiculous that in 2023, oh I have to go to the counter Hold with on. cash. Yeah. Let, let me be Greg Cody. 
there's something nice about going to the counter and scratching out to get that little 100%, gold pencil. Yes. You got to pick the number. You got to, like, it's almost like you're doing the SATs again. You got to bubble it in, like old QP over there. Yep. And then you give them cold, hard greenbacks. And then they give you a slip, and that's your proof. I think that's why I've never played, because I don't have cash on me. So anytime I'm there, I'm like, oh, you guys only take cash, huh? Okay. I think the like, first the first time I went to go play, there's a convenience store in my apartment building. So I walk over there, and I handed them my credit card. <laughs> and so, and they're like, sorry, yeah. no can do. And we're like, really? So I had to walk back to my apartment, get cash, and then that's, go back. That's like d- the dispensaries also. They only take debit and cash, at least in Illinois. I'm not sure about anywhere else. But the first time I Same. went, I was like, this is <laughs> I was like, this is so cool. I can just you know go to the dispensary and get some weed. And I went to check out, and they're like, oh, we only take debit or cash. And I was like, shit, I don't have either on me. So I had to call my dad to go pick up my weed. <laughs> wow. Because <laughs> I knew he had cash on him. And he How was do you like, not have a what? debit card? I do have well, I think I have a debit card. I haven't, I haven't seen it in a while now that you mention it. <laughs> Uh-oh, you better cancel wow. it. <laughs> Yo, man. Wait, yeah, so exactly. did Dad pick up the weed? I mean, yeah. he did? Did he th- Did he do the tax? Did he tax you? Ah. The, he, he did not, no, but the, <laughs> the show I, will tax. Me- I will mention, the taxes at, on dispensary weed in crazy. Illinois are crazy yeah. high. If you spend it's like everywhere. 50 bucks on whatever, like a pre-roll or gummies, they'll tax you like 30 or 40 bucks. That, that tax is, is normal. That's everywhere because that's how, how they got right, legalized. Right, I get that. That's, that's how a, they make money. I'm talking about the other, crazy. the other kind of I tax. I know. Did he take yeah. some? The dad C- tax. <laughs> certainly not. So you, guys, do you, you, dad, you dad tax your kids, right? Like on food and stuff like that, right? Yes, all the time. All the time. Like Steal that. a few fries. I, I saw a clip. Someone sent me a clip of Shaq. And their weed. <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> I saw a clip of someone Her showing Shaq. Her daughter is a college athlete. Yeah. I met Emma. Ah, oh, there you go. Oh, kick, save, and abuse. He's going to get drug tested now. Pays out twins. They got bigger issues. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> uh, Northwestern. Oh, uh, boy. So, guess you're in a you're in a Powerball pact. Yes. With your friend Priya, Priya. who you throw under the bus consistently. Constantly. Yeah, yeah, she snores, she tapes her mouth shut, and she plays the Powerball. Nothing wrong with taping your mouth what shut. What catch? Hostage tape, shout out to them. Who else is in this power pack? Uh, Lehman. Oh, uh, the Lehman. Yes. Okay. And my friend Harry, who works at ESPN. So, do you got Harry Lyles? Yes. There you go, man. Let's name check him so we can hit you with the sounder. <laughs> Harry Lyles. <laughs> you were so proud you knew that. Yeah. <laughs> I know who he is. I know you do. Shout out to everyone who's at NABJ right now. Except, yes. 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 Yes, absolutely. Yes. I want to ask a question, though, because Stugat, you, you told a story. An don't, odd don't, don't. Shadows. Look, it's not an odd shout out. It's NABJ <laughs> week this week. So. I got it. Okay. All right? yes. Relax. Relax on this one. Harry's black. I care about you. Yeah, there you go. So, Stugatz, you told a story before we went on air about getting, um, like, uh, Frankie was making a run. Frankie, our security guard. Yeah, Frankie, our security guard, said, I'm making a run. Do you need anything? You said, yeah, give me a pack of smokes. Yeah. And then he took the change and he bought... Powerball tickets with it. Yes. Or Mega Millions or whatever. That he's in possession of. Yeah, he's in possession of, but he yes. says. But I got the cigarettes. No, but he says that if it wins, he'll split. And I want to ask this very serious question to everybody who goes in on lottery tickets. So without asking, I mean, just quickly, uh, Frankie, who he did, he went, he's the best. I love him. Mm -hmm. He went and got me cigarettes. He took the change and he bought some Mega Millions Mm -hmm. and some Powerball because Charlotte, they are different. Okay. okay? So he did that. Okay. I know that now. Now I'm not in possession of the ticket, so I just have to trust Frankie on this. So here comes my question. If we never see Frankie again, I will hunt him down. Exactly. That's my question. (laughs) If you are in a group play for this but you're the person who did the legwork to buy the tickets are you actually splitting it if it i've thought about this i've thought about this i think if you go in with uh, the way that i would feel best about being the one who does the legwork is taking cash from people before so i'm like this is Mm -hmm. your money that you're giving to me because if it's my money and i put it down and then i get venmoed i'm still like well, it was my cash to begin with. You know, I'm like starts to wow. but I would I would absolutely split it with the people I went in on a pact with. What if you borrowed money from someone and part of that money was used to buy a what ended up being a winning ticket? Do you then owe that person more than what you borrowed off of them? Oh. I borrowed five bucks off Chris Winningham. I used two of them to play Powerball. I won Powerball. 
does Chris Whittingham, is he owed his $5 back or is he owed more? I think he should collect interest on that. Hmm. Interest. But, like, pay, but what, what percentage, right? I pay him back I mean, the next day. Well, there's no interest. Gotta go 50, no, but I mean like lottery. 50-50? Yeah, you got to go. My cash, my dub. Come on now. No way. Stop that. No way. If I give you five bucks, you win the Powerball, you're not going to give me I'm going to give you your money back. <laughs> you're going to give me five wow. bucks. You want a billion dollars. Wait, wow. Tony, how do you handle my situation where I gave Frankie money for cigarettes, not lottery tickets? He decided to buy the lottery tickets it's with my money. It's his choice, though. I'm okay that he did it. Mm. He did the walking. So if we win, how do we split it? In Frankie's yeah. mind, he's it's 100% his way, <laughs> not to me. Absolutely. But how should I approach this? But it's your this? money, though. That's my the thing. money. I didn't ask his for the choice, tickets. He bought them. Right. Yes. His choice, your money. Yeah. You deserve at least maybe $100 million. Really? Out of a billion? It was my more, money. I mean. But it's probably ten <laughs> percent. But after taxes, that's 10%. way more than ten percent. Oh, okay, so ten percent of whatever. Let's go. Let's go yeah. pre-tax. Let's just assume flat flat numbers. Ten percent of whatever the post-tax earnings are. Nah, that's too much. It's my money. That's too. I don't care. What you gonna do about it? Touche. Like you know what I'm saying? Like that's that's what it comes we're down gonna to. to. We're gonna have to go to the streets. We're gonna have to do <laughs> the streets. <laughs> oh Jesus! We're gonna have to fight. Take it to the street, man. You know. I'm going to have, like, an army of Frankies by then, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have Frankie cloned. <laughs> also, by the way, if it's Frankie who actually wins it, yeah, good luck. Take it to the streets of him. That's my boy. I would never do that. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. But if you had to. With you, though? All day. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. Okay. No, now, I, let me ask you this, because now if we won and Frankie realizes, hey, I'm not going to see still till Monday, I can get out of Dodge. Uh, what You're do you do? You're not going to see him for weeks. He's, he's going to go on the lamb. Well, if Frankie wins, what would you do? Like, just leave, right? Uh, if I were Frankie? Yes. Fra I would never talk to any of us again. Including me. Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Especially not used to. <laughs> it's my money. That's why he would especially not. The only way you'd ever see me again is if I bought the Elser and then <laughs> evicted all of us. Hello, out. boys. <laughs> Can we park on our floor now? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> That's what you would do with your earnings, with your winnings. <laughs> Just to make sure we got parking spots. Life is all about a good parking spot, Abib. You park outside of the office, too, Gots. Exactly. <laughs>